Welcome back to Bio 6612. In this lecture, we'll go over implementation and interpretation for DLMMs. Uh, I'm going to focus on binary outcomes because we already covered uh, continuous outcomes for continuous um, for linear and the linear mixed models week. Um, and um, there are a couple other resources here that go into more details of these types of models. So in our GLMMs, like um, LMMs, can be implemented in the LME4 package. And they're implemented using the GLMER function or Glimmer function. It has similar syntax to the GLM function in base R. And um, when you're working with binary data, you can also call this mixed effects logistic regression. So the first example it comes from um, called CBPP disease or contagious bovine pleuropneumonia, which is a major disease of cattle in Africa. And this data set describes the uh, incidence in the blood of CBPP in Zebu cattle during a follow-up survey implemented in 15 commercial herds located in Ethiopia. The goal of this study was to study the within herd spread of CBPP. Um, and I highlight that because that sort of indicates that we're looking at a subject specific effect. In this case, the subject or um, unit of observation is actually the herd. And blood samples were collected quarterly um, from all of these from all of the animals and of these herds to determine their CBPP status. So the data is actually contained within the LME4 package and can be loaded by loading the LME4 library and then loading the CBPP data uh, with these two lines of code. And the data is longitudinal. There are uh, clusters um, of different observations within each herd. So herd is the, is the level um, of the repeated measures now. And it's also in grouped form. If you remember back to logistic regression, we had grouped and un, uh, ungrouped forms of the data, or a group level and subject level. And in this case, we have group level longitudinal data. So, and I encourage you to sort of load the data and print it out on your screen to sort of convince yourself of the case of that. So the data is in this variable, uh, in this very, the variables in this data set include incidence, which is the outcome, um, which is in this case the count of the number of animals in the herd with CBPP at the given time period of measurement, the size, which is the size of the herd at the given time. So incidence is always smaller than size. This is sort of like in this sort of, if you think about the number of like successes, trials format that you see for group level data then um, that's what this is. It's sort of incidence, size of the herd is that same sort of paired set of observations to give the, um, the data that you need for the outcome. And then there's only one covariate here, and that's the period, which is the time period of measure measurement. And in this case, it's actually coded as a factor variable in periods one, two, three, four, um, and I'll explain why this might be a better way of analyzing this data in just a minute. So first of all, is this data balanced? It's always a good thing to check when you have longitudinal data, see is it balanced and is there missing data? And we'll talk a little bit more about missing data in the last lecture of this set. But so there are 15 herds, so 15 units, and herds have as few as one measurement and as many as four measurements. Um, per, per herd. So the data isn't exactly balanced. You have uh, four measurements on some herds, and actually on most of them, but some herds also only have one and a couple have two or three. So it's not perfectly balanced. And also that time variable period is not necessarily equally spaced within herds. Um, so we don't necessarily know that the same, the measurements were taken at the same time for each of the different herds. Of course, it's always good to do exploratory data analysis, especially with longitudinal data. And here I have a spaghetti plot of, uh, since data is in this group level format, it's easy to cal the, calculate the proportion as the incidence divided by the total size. Um, 
And so at each of the different time periods, you can calculate. Um, I, I'm plotting a spaghetti plot that shows that proportion of the herd that actually has CBPP at each of these time periods uh, for all 15 herds. And you can see that they're sort of all over the place. The relationship between um, it, at the relation the um, so the proportion of CBPP over time does not appear to be linear, and that is one reason that it's good to treat time as um, a factor here. Because if you treat it as a factor, then it's okay. It doesn't matter that time is nonlinear. If it's continuous. If time is treated as a continuous, you're going to want to see a linear relationship between time and that proportion. And on top of that, because we don't know if the time periods are actually equal um, across the different herds, um, it makes sense to treat it as this factor. Then you no longer get the increase of the same interpretation of time as a continuous covariate, um, but it sort of helps with the nonlinearity of the outcome in time here. So I'm going to do, I'm going to use a random intercept model with the CBP TV data. And so we said originally at the beginning of introducing this data set that we were interested in within herd spread of CBPP. And this suggests a random intercept model because um, within herd is a subject specific effect. So we're looking at a subject specific interpretation of the CBP incidence here, where in this case, subject is actually a herd if that's the unit level. And so the way that I run the inter random intercept model here is very similar to, is really it's just a combination of, of running um, the regular LM, MM model plus uh, the GLM component where I have, because I have it in group level format, I have the sort of incidence and the size minus incidence. So that's like the successes and the failures. Uh, binded together against the variables I'm interested in. in this case period is a fixed effect and we also have our in random intercept um, on herd which is here using the same syntax we did for LMMs and then we additionally have this family statement this is family equals binomial uh, and the default link for the binomial family would be the logit link but if you wanted to use something like a probit link instead, you could by changing that link to like probit or C log log, like we did for the GLM models. And then the data is the CVPP. So that's how that model is run. And then I'm producing a summary here. I cut out some of the stuff that's produced just to fit it on this slide, but um, again, you get your fixed effects like we did when we did the regular LMM model, and that gives you your beta zero, and then your betas for each of the different periods, since period is a factor variable here. And you also get your random effects. And in this case, we only have a random intercept so on herd, so that's what we see here. And there's it gives you the variance of your random intercept. That's your sigma squared beta What if you have... Um, Um, the beta i's that have a normal distribution. Hold on, I'm just going to move that over here. We have that assumption, and then that sigma squared beta is that number here. And you can, you'll notice here we don't have a sigma squared error epsilon term, and that's because uh, the variance in this model is only um, coming from the mu's, so you don't actually have um, an estimate and then a separate parameter that's estimated for the variance of the of the measurement error. Instead, the variance is going to be that pi times one minus pi, which you can calculate from the betas actually. So, moving on. So we can let's talk about inference for fixed effects. The summary output of GLMER provides inference while MER, LMER did not. Um, and that's for a couple of reasons. Um, for Glimmer, the model is fit by approximation to the maximum likelihood uh, rather than the restricted maximum likelihood. Um, because what was, uh, and um, 
So you can use likelihood ratio based tests. And some of the findings that we have. So, and so what you see is that in that output, um, going back to it, we actually had p values that were automatically returned. And these are walled p values based on the walled z test um, at each level of each covariate. And if you want to give us, if you want to get results from using an ANOVA, you can do that as well, and it will use a likelihood ratio based statistic. Um, and what we find here that each level of period is significant. If you want an example of using an ANOVA instead, here I'm going to uh, run a reduced model with just an intercept for fixed effects, no period. Um, and running the ANOVA on the reduced model and the, the model with period, um, you can see it's a likelihood ratio based test. And this is testing all three levels, all four levels of the period covariate, and it's a highly significant. And um, so there are several ways you can you can compute confidence intervals that are built into the GLMER framework. Um, the ones that I have printed here are based on the likelihood ratio test, which will usually be um, a have a little bit more power than the ones based on the walled, but you, the walled confidence intervals are still appropriate to use and usually will be the fastest to compute. Um, and you can also compute a, a bootstrap interval if you'd like. And these confidence intervals should all be relatively similar. So where things can get really tricky with GLMMs is in parameter interpretation. So for LMMs, the fixed effects had a marginal, marginal or population level interpretation. And so actually for LMMs that you end up with an interpretation that is similar to um, the GE model with continuous data. However, when you have a link function involved and the link is not the identity link, things get a little trickier with the interpretation for GLMMs. So the beta zero, and these are still log odds ratios. It's just they're not necessarily the log odds ratio on average for the whole population. So beta zero will be the log odds of the outcome in period one for the average herd. And more generally speaking, it'd be the log odds of the outcome when all covariate values are zero. And in this case, it's for period one because uh, that's the reference category for the period variable. Uh, and then the beta for period two compared to period one, I'm just uh, putting one of them down here, is the log odds of CBPP comparing period two to period one for two similar subjects or two similar herds in this case. Um, And the reason that we have to say for two similar subjects rather than saying on average in the population is because um, when you actually like do the math on this, the the B1 and B2 terms, the, the random intercepts are not going to cancel out. And they all have the same value across all subjects. So when you interpret beta 1, what you're actually interpreting is beta 1 plus beta uh, little b1 minus uh, little b2, where b1 is the intercept for subject one or herd one and b2 is the inter random intercept for subject two and we say for two similar subjects because in we need b1 minus b2 to be equal to zero in order to inter interpret beta one and for s two similar two similar subjects would have um, a similar random intercept here So we also can interpret each random effect bi, and in general terms, that bi is the difference in log odds of disease when all co other covariates are zero between the ith subject and the average subject. So in the context of our problem, this is the difference in the log odds of CBPP at period one between the ith herd and the average herd. So that's where you get your sort of subject-specific interpretation.
So um, it's pretty, it's always good to check your model assumptions. In this case, we want to check that the random effects are normally distributed. Um, and we can do that by pulling out the random intercepts terms from that model um, and then plotting them as a histogram. And in this case, we only have 15 herds, so it's, we're not going to see a nice uh, normal distribution on those uh, random intercepts because 15 is just a small number. But I think that they are distributed around zero, and our normal um, assumption really isn't too, uh, too, it's not too hard to, to reason through that here. So I have a second um, binary data example that I wanted to go through as well to highlight a few other things that can happen when you're running a GLMM with binary data. And this data set comes from a randomized controlled trial among women of childbearing age to evaluate the effects of an educational intervention that's unspecified. The participants in the trial self-rated their health status as either good or poor. So that's the binary outcome there is good or poor health status. And the researchers would like to assess the effect of the intervention on self-rated health across the follow-up period, controlling for age. So they want to know how health changes over time, controlling for age. And these data were measured at four time points, uh, at randomization or zero months, three months, six months, and 12 months after randomization. The variables in the data set include ID for the unique subject identifier, time, which is the visit number, um, where, which is currently coded as a categorical variable where one is baseline or at randomization, two is three months after randomization, three is six months after randomization, four is 12 months after randomization. Other variables include treatment, which is control versus intervention, health, which is the outcome of interest, and it's poor versus good. An age group, which is a categorical uh, variable denoting age group at the time of randomization, and it's three levels, three different categories that it can take. So the first thing that I'm going to do here is read in the data set, and this is provided on the course website. This one doesn't actually come from online or from an R package, so you're going to have to load it if you want to, and then um, read it in. And I'm reading it in using read CSV here. Don't worry about what's going on in here. That's just a fancy way of uh, giving it the file path to where my data is actually stored. And I'm going to do a couple things to change the data a little bit. First, I'm um, changing health from a character to a factor variable so that I can denote poor the reference category and good the other category. I'm also turning treatment into a factor variable where control is the reference and intervention is, is not, this is a non-reference. Um, and then finally, I'm creating this new, new time and months variable. So I said time before was one, two, three, four, but that doesn't actually denote the spacing in time. Um, as you can see, the between three and four um, time points, there's a six month gap, but between one and time points two and three, there's a three month gap. And I want the numeric time variable to actually reflect that um, for the sake of interpretation of results that use that variable as a numeric variable. So I'm using this case when statements, which is like using a series of nested if else statements that allows you to define uh, new variables um, based on values that other variables in the data set have. And so what this saying here is if that time variable uh, is equal to one, then define this new variable to have a value of zero for zero months. If the time variable is equal to two, then let that take on the value of three for three months. If time was uh, three, then six months. Otherwise, that's what this true is here. Otherwise, I said equal to 12 months. So that's gonna define a new time variable um, in number of months in this study. So this data, as opposed to the last binary uh, multi-level data set we looked at, is in subject level format rather than group level. There are 80 subjects in total with up to four visits per subject. And there's some dropout 
at the first time point, um, all 80 people are there. At the second, there's only 78, then 70, then 51. So people are sort of dropping out of the study over time. And so researchers are interested in the effect of treatment on each woman's health status, controlling for age and follow-up period. They believe the outcome over time may vary by subject, and they want to include a random slope in the model. So I'm going to define that model here. So as, as um, main effects, we're going to have treatment, age group, and time in months. And we're going to have a random intercept here, as well as a random slope um, on subject ID. And that's all defined the same way we did for LMMs. The only difference here is we're defining the family, uh, which gives it that logit link. On here, since it's subject level data, the outcome is just that binary outcome health. Producing a summary of that model, again, once we get, we get random effects. This time, since we have two random effects, we have the variance for the intercept and the variance for the time and months, and then the correlation between the random slope and the random intercept. And they're perfectly correlated, which is a little crazy. Then we have our table of fixed effects here. And the only thing that is significant in this study is, um, is the time variable. Defective treatment is not significant. And this is a case where here I'm just trying to show you something in particular. Um, about actual comp compute, actually computing these models. But normally speaking, if I see something like this, where I have a perfect correlation between the stroke, the, the, the slope and the intercept, that indicates to me, sorry, I'm trying to point an arrow to that. That indicates to me that something might be a little bit off about, uh, about this analysis. And I would want to kind of plot the random effects to make sure that there isn't something weird going on and do a little bit more exploratory data analysis to see if I can understand why I'm getting a perfect correlation between the random slope and the random intercept. One of the reasons I wanted to bring up a new data set is to point out how convergence issues can, concur, can occur when you're doing this type of model. And actually, convergence issues are quite common for binary and Poisson GLMMs, um, just because the models are complicated and if you have small cells uh, for your outcome, not a lot of people in each of the different cells that are defined by your multiple covariates, then you can have problems with the algorithm converging. Uh, it's particularly likely when you have imbalanced data or a lot of covariates in your model. So the example below that I've given has convergence issue issues. So in this example, I'm treating time as a factor. So you have four time uh, periods. And I'm, I'm adding in an interaction term between treatment and time period. Um, so now, as fixed effects, I have treatment. I still actually only have a random intercept here. I don't have a random intercept and slope. But I have treatment times factored time. And I still have age group in the model. And when I have that convergence issue, I, have, I get this warning that says, um, warning, check convergence, model failed to converge. And there are a couple of things that you can do to um, fix this convergence issue. One thing is to increase the number of iterations. Um, but another thing is to change the way that you're actually optimizing the algorithm. And to change the optimization method for the algorithm, you can use the control argument um, inside the GLMER function. And uh, the one that I like to use for convergence issues is this Bobia. I don't actually know how to pronounce that, B-O-B-Y-Q-A. Um, optimizer can help. So now I'm rerunning the same model and now I'm just not getting any convergence warnings because I'm choosing a different optimizer. So a couple other considerations uh, for GLMMs. So when you're doing using count data, I'm not going through any examples here, but the implementation and interpretations uh, that we talked about in this lecture are analogous for mixed effects in Poisson regression, except you have rate ratio instead of logs ratio.
oh, sorry, it's rate ratio instead of um, odds ratio. And like we did in other parts of, uh, and, and using the GLMM for non-longitudinal data, you can still use other link functions as, if you want to, the same way that we did before. And finally, um, it's always important to think about missing data when you're dealing with longitudinal data problems uh, because it occurs quite regularly. And that's something we're gonna talk about a little bit in the next lecture.